Now on BBC One, Screen One presents an unusual and sometimes disturbing film marking Halloween. Over the centuries there have been countless reports of ghosts and ghouls, but the line between fact and fiction has always been unclear. Using the modern idiom of the outside broadcast, Michael Parkinson, Sarah Green, Mike Smith and Craig Charles star in Ghost Watch. On Halloween night in 1992, the BBC aired a TV special named Ghost Watch for the first and, so far, only time. Shot in the style of a live documentary and starring several TV celebrities as themselves, the drama was based around a house in the Greater London area that, according to the story, was supposed to be haunted. However, despite being a work of fiction, Ghost Watch left viewers horrified, garnered a record number of complaints, and has subsequently never been broadcast on British television ever again. But in spite of, or perhaps because of its notoriety, Ghostwatch has gained quite a following over the past three decades, and is now seen as a pioneer in televised horror and the found footage genre. Opinions at the time were certainly divided. Some saw Ghostwatch as nothing but a cruel hoax, and argued that the trusted BBC had maliciously deceived the public. Others saw it as a work of genius, using creative ideas and concepts that were years ahead of its time. Some were even worried that, while the events depicted in Ghostwatch were clearly fake, the broadcast might have acted as a giant seance, unleashing evil spirits throughout the nation. But one thing people could all agree on was that Ghostwatch was bloody terrifying, and there was no denying that it had a power all of its own. As a young child, I didn't actually see Ghostwatch on broadcast, and having finally watched it for the first time, I'm glad I didn't. It's exactly the kind of thing that, had I heard about it at the time, I would have been sorely tempted to watch it sneakily in the darkness of my bedroom, with the volume down and the remote control grasped firmly in hand. Had I done this, I doubt that I or my sister would have gotten very much sleep for the next fortnight. And we wouldn't have been the only ones, as the complaints of Ghostwatch-induced trauma, experienced by children and adults alike, continued to flare up in the programme's aftermath. This is the story of Ghostwatch, and how it did its job as a horror a little bit too well. Ghostwatch was originally conceived by horror writer Steve Volk as a six-part drama series, centred around paranormal investigations and culminating in a live TV broadcast from a haunted house, during which all hell would break loose. Much of his inspiration came from the Enfield Poltergeist, a series of events that were covered extensively by the British press in the late 1970s. The reports of supernatural activity that came from the residents and neighbours of this council house were the subject of a BBC4 radio documentary, and would later provide the inspiration for the 2016 film The Conjuring 2. While there were many doubts cast over the poltergeist's authenticity, and the family's two daughters would admit that some of the incidents were, in fact, pranks, the reports of moving objects, strange banging noises, and unearthly voices provided the perfect basis for a gripping horror story. Using documentary-style filmmaking, many years before the boom of found footage, Ghostwatch was all set to be a groundbreaking horror series that the British public would never forget. When it was recommended that the series be rewritten as a single 90-minute feature, Volk suggested that they base this on the premise for episode 6, presenting the entire film as a live broadcast and recruiting some well-known faces at the BBC for an added layer of believability. These actors, who would be playing themselves, included celebrated talk show host Michael Parkinson, children's TV presenter Sarah Green, and Craig Charles, best known at the time for the sci-fi comedy series Red Dwarf. An additional part was written for Mike Smith, another broadcaster who was married to Sarah Green. The story goes that, after seeing his wife's script for Ghostwatch, Smith reached out to Steve Volk and asked, can I be in it too? The rest of the cast were made up by actors, including Gillian Bevan as parapsychologist Dr Lynn Pascoe, Brid Brennan as Pamela Early, the mother living inside the haunted house, 
and real-life sisters Michelle and Cherise Wesson as her daughters Suzanne and Kim. Perhaps the most unusual member of the cast of Ghost Watch would be played by Keith Ferrari. Simply credited as Ghost, he would appear on screen at several moments, most often in the shadows, backgrounds or in reflections, making him fairly difficult to see clearly. However, if the viewer managed to catch more than a glimpse, they'd be in for a gruesome surprise, as Ferrari's makeup effects gave the impression that his face had been horribly mutilated and that he had no eyes. The ghost, who would be better known as Pipes, certainly made an impression on those who saw Ghostwatch and left many viewers wondering if they'd really seen him. The programme was split between two main areas. First, there was the studio set where Michael Parkinson would present the show, discuss paranormal goings-on with Dr Pasco, and take phone calls along with Mike Smith, as viewers called the studio with their own stories and sightings. A phone number would appear on screen, and this was a genuine phone number used by the BBC for various phone-ins and competitions. Trust me, if you ever watch the Saturday morning programme going live, then that number is etched into your brain for all eternity. The rest of the programme followed Sarah Green and Craig Charles on location as they spoke with the locals and took a closer look at the supposedly haunted house. As the night wore on, the jovial tone of the presenters would turn to terror and the investigation would fall into chaos. And throughout the entire production, the mysterious figure of Mr Pipes lurked in the background, watching the events unfold. Many elements worked together in order to create the illusion that Ghostwatch was actually happening, despite the fact that the entire production had already been shot and edited in the weeks leading up to Halloween. The footage, particularly the scenes shot on location, didn't exactly look high budget or polished, and certainly didn't feel like they had been pre-recorded. Cameras would shake as the crew ran from room to room, boom mics were often visible at the top of the screen, and the sound and visuals would warp or cut from time to time, giving the impression that the equipment and transmission might be malfunctioning. Remember, this was years before the Blair Witch Project or the Paranormal Activity series, and so audiences were not used to this style being used in fiction. Additionally, I have to say that the actors playing the family and their neighbours felt extremely natural in their appearance, dialogue and delivery, as did the callers who made it through to the BBC hotline. Even back in the studio, conversations didn't feel scripted or rehearsed at all, particularly in those moments where things weren't going according to plan. Even watching it now, 30 years later, the cast appear to be just as shocked and surprised as we feel watching at home. Because a fictional work giving the illusion of a factual production was a fairly new idea, Certain precautions were put in place in order to reassure the audience that what they were seeing wasn't actually real. However, the overall effectiveness of these precautions is somewhat questionable, for reasons I'm about to get into. It's important to remember that, while it seems obvious to us today, not everyone watches media in quite the same way, and the general public wouldn't be nearly as critical of what they were watching back in 1992. Many of them were just along for the ride. Immersed in the action and with the familiarity of those well-known faces, large segments of the audience probably weren't even looking for evidence to debunk what they were seeing. And maybe that's no bad thing. To use the immortal words of Dean Lerner, if you go to a Punch and Judy show and you're only watching The Wires, you're a freak. Here's what Team Ghostwatch agreed to do. Before and after the broadcast, the continuity announcer would make it clear that Ghostwatch was a work of fiction. The Screen One logo would be shown at the beginning, indicating that this was part of the BBC's ongoing anthology drama series. Credits would also be shown, naming the writer, the actors, even if they were playing themselves, and even the name of the man behind the eponymous ghost. Ghostwatch had also been the cover feature of that week's Radio Times, a popular UK TV guide. And finally, that hotline we mentioned earlier had been set up to play a recorded message, reassuring anyone who felt compelled to call in that the show was completely fake. So, how did it all go wrong? 
Well, if you go back and listen to the announcement, the wording doesn't make it explicitly clear. It mentions the blurring of fact and fiction, and reports of ghosts and ghouls, which possibly just added to the confusion. Plus, if you happen to tune in a few minutes later, which was easily done as the broadcast started at 9.25 instead of on the half-hour mark, you would have missed this announcement altogether. In that case, you'd probably miss the Screen 1 logo and the opening credits as well, leaving no indication that the show was fictional until the very end. Don't forget, Ghostwatch was showing on BBC One, so there were no ad breaks at all during its 90-minute runtime, where the message could have been repeated. So, in order to hear that announcement, if you missed the first one, you'd need to watch it until the very end, and not change the channel or turn off the TV until the credits had completely finished. Also, this was the image they chose to show right after the credits, so I'm not sure how much comfort that would have brought. This left viewers reliant on the other precautions. Did you recognise the Screen 1 logo and know that this was the usual drama slot? Did you remember to buy a copy of the Radio Times that week and not some other TV guides? Did you actually read the credits as they were scrolling by? I doubt that's something most people actually do. Just so we're clear, the appearance of credits alone would not have indicated that the events were fake, as credits are also shown in factual programming. Plus, the role of writer does not exclusively apply to fiction. If you noticed that there were actors credited to different parts, or that someone was billed as a ghost, then that would have been clear enough. But remember, this was still the pre-internet era, so you couldn't just look up IMDb after the show. If you missed it, then you missed it, and that was you, left alone in the dark. But what about that phone message we mentioned earlier? Well, it turned out that Ghostwatch received so many calls on the night that the BBC's line became jammed, and the message would no longer play. So, in that scenario, you'd be left frantically calling up the BBC on Halloween night, trying to tell the studio that you'd seen a ghost, a real one, right there on the TV, and the presenters hadn't even noticed. You'd be trying to get through, the fate of Michael Parkinson was in your hands, but instead you were met with nothing but a deadline. Pun intended. Now, I'm not saying that it was the job of Team Ghostwatch to hold the audience's hands and give more warnings, nor am I saying that all the people who misunderstood Ghostwatch were idiots. That's not what I'm saying at all. All I'm trying to do is provide a little more context to help explain why the production ended up creating the perfect storm. After all, there were no real guidelines in place for the creative team because such a thing hadn't been attempted before, and the people at home had no idea what to make of it because they'd never seen anything like it. And if it hadn't had the impact that it did, then we might not be here talking about it today. It's also worth noting that Ghostwatch was never meant to mock or ridicule the audience, even those who were completely taken in by its ruse. Steve Volk's intention was always to create a good scare, the kind he would have appreciated as a youngster, because his favourite ghost stories were always the ones that felt like they could have actually happened. And I've got to say, that idea still holds up 30 years later. Over 11 million people tuned in to Ghostwatch on Halloween night in 1992. Over the course of the evening, the BBC received an estimated 1 million phone calls, most of them to the Banjaxed hotline. However, a significant number of viewers were also calling up the BBC's main switchboard, with many asking if the show was really happening, and the rest comprised largely of both compliments and complaints. An additional reassurance message was shown on the BBC later that evening in an effort to calm the masses, because, well, a lot of people were still freaking out. The night in question was certainly an eventful one. But what about the show itself? What actually happens during Ghost Watch? Feel free to skip this next section if you'd prefer to see it for yourself, but otherwise, here's a rundown of everything that happens in the film. Try to approach this feature with the atmosphere of the original broadcast still in mind, and remember that nothing like this had really been attempted on television ever before. Please also bear in mind that Ghostwatch does contain references to animal and child abuse, 
along with the details of a person who takes their own life. However, these are just descriptions given by other characters, and none of this is shown visually. Please also note that, in the film, the space under the stairs is referred to as the glory hole. I'll be calling it the basement, because that's what I thought it was at first, plus apparently I have the sense of humour of a 13 year old boy and can't keep saying glory hole without bursting into fits of giggles. Which just wouldn't be appropriate now, would it? A TV screen flickers before a rock bearing the Screen One logo bursts forth and rolls into place. The Ghostwatch title card and names of the main cast and writer appear briefly before Michael Parkinson introduces the programme. He warns us that what we are about to watch is a unique live investigation of the supernatural that contains material that some viewers may find disturbing. Parkinson points to the image of a seemingly ordinary house and claims that this house has been the site of an astonishing barrage of paranormal activity for the past 10 months. He then introduces a piece of footage marked University Research Video shot at the house at 10pm on the 11th of July 1992. The tape shows two young girls in their bedroom about to go to sleep. At 3.55am, the girls are frightened by some loud banging noises and they call out for their mother, saying he's back, as random objects are hurled across the room by an unseen force. The older girl keeps crying, don't touch me. The girl's mother appears and hurries them out of the room before the light bulb on the bedside lamp explodes. We see a montage of the Ghostwatch crew loading up their equipment into BBC vans and preparing to roll into action. A crowd has gathered round the haunted house at Fox Hill Drive as Parkinson's voiceover introduces the first live TV Ghostwatch and hopes that the investigation will provide irrefutable proof that ghosts exist. Parkinson then introduces our subject expert, Dr Lynn Pascoe, and announces that the phone lines will be open throughout the broadcast. He then introduces our field reporter and well-known ghost hunter, Craig Charles, who is being his usual happy-go-lucky scamp. He's outside the house with Pam Early, the mother from the video we saw a few moments earlier. We then cut back to the studio where Mike Smith gives us the hotline number and states that this is our part of the studio tonight as we see a team of operators sitting at their desks already taking phone calls. Smith jokingly says that his wife will be spending the night in the most haunted house in Britain and we see a shot of our second reporter, Sarah Green, on location with the Ghostwatch crew. After Parkinson points out that the effects of the supernatural can be devastatingly real, Craig Charles begins to interview the early family. They mention broken objects, such as plates, teapots and cups, a thick, disgusting smell that came from a broken tap, and mysterious stains that would appear on clothing out of nowhere. Back in the studio, Dr Pascoe says we should believe Pam and notes that the family are clearly distraught. We then go over to an optimistic Sarah Green, who briefly mentions that she had her own supernatural experience in the past, and we get some friendly husband and wife banter between her and Mike Smith. Sarah then introduces us to electronics engineer and member of the Society for Psychical Research, Alan Demescu, who talks us through all of the equipment that the Ghostwatch team will be using. He mentions a number of things the crew will be looking out for, including inexplicable noises, strange voices, electrical interference, and even the possibility of full-blown visual apparitions. We see equipment set up to monitor the temperature for intense cold spots and unusual frequencies, and the cameraman Chris Miller demonstrates that his camera has been adapted to detect infrared. Sarah briefly chats with sound man and Adrian Edmondson lookalike Mike Ayton, then she enters the house to meet the family. Back at the studio, Dr Pascoe explains why this home was chosen and why conducting the investigation on Halloween might increase the likelihood of paranormal activity. The hosts then take their first call, from Emma Stapleton from Slough, who believes that she saw a figure in black standing near the curtain in the girls' bedroom. The hosts agree to look into it later in the programme. We then go back to the house where we hear a few ominous knocking sounds before Craig Charles jumps out of the cupboard wearing a Halloween mask. 
the kids laugh and, after Sarah composes herself, we move upstairs to the room where the hauntings began. The family recount their first supernatural experience, which happened on the 28th of December 1991, when the eldest daughter, Suzanne, saw someone standing over her bed, watching her. At first she thought it was her mother, but Pam confirms that she'd already fallen asleep in front of the television. Pam thought Suzanne had been dreaming until another strange thing happened in her own room a few nights later. Pam says she was awoken by some terrible banging noises, like the whole room was going to come apart. The children heard it too, and the youngest daughter, Kim, demonstrates the noise by stamping her feet on the floor. To keep the children calm, Pam told them that the noise must have been pipes, as in the pipes used in the home's central heating system. From then on, any time Kim heard the noise, she would announce that it's pipes. Pipes is here. Kim says she can feel a presence and points towards the curtain, the same spot that the caller claims to have seen the figure in black. That's where he hides, she says. Kim then shows us where Pipes lives, down in the basement, where the door has been boarded shut. She claims she saw him there, staring at her, through a crack in the door. Kim then shows us a drawing she made of Pipes, a bald figure in a button-down dress covered with scars and blood. One eye socket appears to be hollow, and the other is coloured in with red. They put the picture on the fridge, and Kim remarks that Pipes would like that, because he likes everything freezing cold. Pam then shows us some disturbing pages in Suzanne's exercise book, with scrawled, barely legible writing on one page and a drawing on the other. In this brief shot, we can see the words home, baby and bloody, and the drawing appears to be another image of a bleeding pipes, this time with his own pipe exposed. Pam admits that she was so angry that she wanted to hit Suzanne, but Suzanne claims that it wasn't her, and that's not even her handwriting. Back at the studio, Mike reports that they've already had a number of callers claiming they also saw the figure by the curtain. We're now ready to replay the tape, and we can quite clearly see the outline of a person standing over the girls' beds. Dr. Pasco asks if they can rewind the tape and play it back slowly, only this time, the shadowy figure seems to have vanished. Parkinson declares it a false alarm, but Dr. Pasco claims she can still see something, and marks the outline on the screen using a light pencil. Back at Fox Hill Drive, Sarah asks Pam what the worst incident was, and Pam leads the crew to the sealed basement door. She says that her ex-husband used to develop photos in there, and after they split, she went looking for a letter from her solicitor. While she was inside, the door closed tight, as if it was being pushed from the outside. Unable to escape, Pam panicked and screamed for her daughters, who couldn't hear anything except the banging, leading Kim to exclaim that Pipes was back again. The girls eventually came to her rescue, but while Pam was trapped inside, she swears she could sense a man breathing right next to her face, with a strong foul odour like rotten cabbage. She believes she nearly died that night. After the incident, Pam wrote to the council to try and get the family moved, but nobody would take her seriously. She says a social worker recommended that the whole family see a psychiatrist. However, it wasn't long before the press got hold of the story, and Pam shows Sarah a collection of newspaper clippings, with headings such as, I believe in the devil, says Spook House Mother. Unhappy with how the family were presented in the papers, Pam then approached local TV, and she shows a video clip of her and the girls being interviewed. When Kim is asked if she thinks Mr Pipes has come to hurt her, she answers, I think he's come to hurt everybody. I think he wants to do nasty things. Pam leaves for the mini-studio, where she will be taking calls. Dr. Pascoe claims to understand Pam's trauma, as she once dealt with a rather violent poltergeist in Germany. It was Dr. Pascoe's idea to bring the family onto the show, and Pam, speaking from the mini-studio, says that they agreed because Suzanne was being teased at school and called a liar. They hope that, after tonight, everyone will finally believe their story.
We then take a call from Sandra Hughes from Sussex, who talks about her experience growing up in a haunted house in Brighton. She later learned about a boy who died there. Michael Parkinson then shows us the cover of Dr. Pascoe's book, Angels of the Odd, and we're shown another university research video, this time depicting the Gansfeld technique, which is a real assessment used by parapsychologists. We see Suzanne with her eyes and ears covered, and we learn that they produced a recording from this session. Dr. Pascoe claims that this is completely undoctored, and that the voice continued even with the subject's lips sealed shut. Before it plays, Parkinson gives an extra warning to viewers of a nervous disposition. On the tape, we hear the panicked voices of the family, breaking noises and screams, before an unearthly grunting noise comes forth and begins to speak. As the tape plays on, we can see a shadowy figure emerging right behind Dr. Pascoe's left shoulder. For those who may be wondering what the voice was saying, a subtitled version of the clip is available on the Ghostwatch Behind the Curtain YouTube channel. The voice begins by reciting the nursery rhyme, Round and Round the Garden. When asked its name, it claims to be Jesus Christ, then responds with Ha Ha, very funny. When asked if they're in heaven, it responds with another line from a rhyme, All good children go to heaven, and then says because I smell blood, fee fi fo fum imitating the giant from Jack and the Beanstalk. Dr Pascoe claims that analysts from Cambridge confirmed that these were two separate voices, and that Suzanne was unable to imitate the voice herself, even while under hypnosis. More details are revealed about the reported poltergeist activity, including levitating objects, the sounds of scratching heard from the walls, and we see an entire collection of items that were broken, apparently from extreme changes in temperature, including bent spoons and a watch that has stopped. We then talk to Suzanne about some marks and lesions that have been appearing on her face. In her own words, it was horrible, like I'd just wake up and it would feel like someone was all over me. We then see some photos of Suzanne's face and the back of her neck covered with fresh scratch marks. Dr. Pascoe explains that Suzanne, as an introverted, anxious girl on the brink of puberty, would be a classic target or focus for a poltergeist. She tells Pam through the video link that a poltergeist can be either person or location based, and that perhaps this one might be both. To avoid accusations of bias, we then go via video link to American physicist Dr. Emilio Silvestri, a former member of the Skeptic Society, Psychops. The two doctors disagree, because of course they do, and it's clear that Dr. Pascoe thinks very little of him. Back at the house, Suzanne echoes the same feelings towards Dr. Silvestri, and Sarah notes that Suzanne turned off the TV while he was on. What does he know, she says. He's not here. Sarah then recounts her own ghost story, where she woke up to the sound of music and the sight of a woman's face in a friend's house in the Cotswolds. She notes that the experience was not scary, but beautiful, and that it inspired her to join in with the Ghostwatch investigation. Kim goes upstairs to bed and says goodnight to her mum via the camera. Sarah goes to make a cup of coffee as she's feeling cold, and comments that the fact that nothing's happened yet is only making things eerier. The cameraman points out that his watch stopped right before they went on air. Suzanne enters the kitchen to help them, apparently in good spirits, and we return to the studio. Parkinson introduces a new guest with a tale to tell who has his face blurred to protect his identity. He talks of an experience he'd had living in a flat where he kept encountering evidence of saliva and excrement, supposedly from another poltergeist. We go back to Craig Charles, who's out and about in the neighbourhood, ready to talk with some of the residents. Beverly and Yvonne, who live opposite Pam, tell him that they've also heard strange noises coming from Pam's house, and remember seeing a smashed window and Pam and Kim crying in the garden. They also talk about some weird and horrible things that happened in the area, including a child who went missing, a five-year-old that was attacked with a knife, 
and a pregnant black Labrador that was found dead and mutilated in the local playground. Craig then talks to Arthur Lacey, a spiritualist who had tried, unsuccessfully, to exercise the house at Foxhill Drive. He claims that the experience left him physically ill for a week afterwards. Something didn't want me near it, he says. Didn't believe it was dead. At various points throughout these scenes, we can see a bald figure watching in the background, its eyes not visible on camera. We cut back to the house as Sarah has made a discovery. We see a perfectly round circle of moisture that has appeared on the carpet, seemingly from nowhere. While trying to take a sample of the fluid, Sarah is startled by Suzanne, who has appeared at the door. Back at the studio, Dr. Pascoe explains that the presence of water is a common occurrence with poltergeists, usually manifesting between the phases of noise and moving objects. We then take a call from Kevin Tripp from Neath, who claims that he and his friends were startled by a falling plate. Parkinson and Pascoe appear to be more amused than terrified, and Parkinson makes a request for serious calls only. Back at the house, something seems to be happening. The crew have detected scratching noises coming from Pam's bedroom, and their investigation is interrupted by the two girls shouting that Pipes is here. Loud bangs are heard downstairs, and Sarah discovers a trail of children's drawings in the kitchen, leading to a perfect circle on the ground made of crayons. A cat at the back door startles Sarah, but something far more sinister appears to be reflected in the glass. A bald figure wearing a long dark robe. This goes unnoticed by the crew, and as the camera pans back, there's nothing there. More bangs are heard from above, and Sarah runs upstairs to help the children, before she's informed by Radio Mike that Suzanne is out of bed. She's then spotted moments later, making banging noises on a pipe. We hear a loud scream from the girls' bedroom, and Sarah runs to their aid, comforting Suzanne, who is crying and repeating, It wasn't me. Back at the studio, Dr. Pascoe sits in stunned silence, and a disappointed Michael Parkinson declares the investigation has led to a hoax. Dr. Pascoe is not convinced, having witnessed so many strange occurrences at the house herself, and desperately tries to argue that this prank is all part of the phenomenon. Parkinson questions a distraught Suzanne who doesn't want to talk about it. Her mum arrives to comfort her, and she explains that she just wanted to show them. It was what you wanted, wasn't it? She cries. We just gave you what you wanted. Despite what we've just seen, Pam remains adamant that her family have been telling the truth. We then return to a fairly smug Dr Silvestri, who dismisses the early family as disturbed attention seekers. Dr Pasco is not amused. We then go over to Mike on the phone lines, who says they are still getting calls about that shadowy figure. All the descriptions claim that they saw an old man or a woman, bald with a skull-like head, dark eyes or holes for eyes, wearing a black robe or a dress, which is buttoned up to the neck. These descriptions are consistent with Kim's drawing of Mr Pipes. We then hear another ghost story from someone named Laura, who describes living in an old house in Devonshire, where she saw ornaments shatter and shadows moving at the foot of the bed. However, the tape appears to malfunction before the story can go any further. The hosts then take a call from a woman who wishes to remain anonymous, who tells them that a glass table has exploded in her home during the programme, causing injuries to her husband and frightening the children. She demands to know, why are you doing this? And Parkinson, though sympathetic, reminds her that her children should be in bed as it's gone past the 9pm watershed, perhaps as a subtle warning to any young viewers at home. The woman claims that her children are glued to the TV set and won't go to bed, and that their clock stopped at 9.30. Once the caller is gone, Parkinson tells her, if she's still watching, to turn off the TV and send the kids to bed. Don't let your imaginations run riot, he tells the audience, as these things are very, very rare indeed. We then examine one of the research videos in which Kim talks about Mr Pipes. 
She describes his face, with his bald head, bloody eye and scratches, along with the long black button dress she saw him wearing. Kim's description matches the ones in the phone calls perfectly. Dr. Pasco starts to reconsider that Kim might be the focus of the poltergeist, not Suzanne. We then cut back to Foxhill Drive, where Pam tells us she can hear the sound of cats. Kim comes downstairs to tell them that something is wrong, and they uncover Suzanne on the bed, eyes open and motionless, her face a mess of scratches. Sarah touches her head and says that she's burning up. She goes to the bathroom to get Suzanne a cold flannel and is convinced that she saw something behind the door. We heard a loud breathing noise right before she said this, but when we look back, there's nothing there. The studio offers to send help, but Sarah is worried about how Suzanne will react. Kim then mutters that Pipe says they've got to stay. Back at the studio, Dr. Pasco now believes that both girls are being targeted by the poltergeist. Mike Smith then announces a very important phone call, which he insists they take right away. The caller's name is Mary Christopher, and she describes how, whenever she and her siblings were naughty, their mother would tell them that Mother Seddons will come to get you. Years later, Mary discovered that Mother Seddons really did exist and was a baby farmer who would kill the children in her care by drowning them. The reason she's calling is because Mother Seddons used to live in Fox Hills, the same area being investigated on tonight's programme, and she's certain that this was the exact same location where the Early family are now being haunted. Back at the house, Sarah tells us that Suzanne is feeling a little better, and they've decided it's best to get the family out of the house. Kim protests and says that she's got to talk to somebody. She stands in silence, facing the area where she claimed that Pipes would hide. When asked, where's Pipes? She answers, here. When asked, what does he look like? She answers, somebody's mum. As the children are moved out of the bedroom, more banging noises are heard, and as the camera pans the room, we get a much clearer view of Pipes, standing by the curtain. But when the camera turns back, Pipes has vanished. Kim continues to argue that Pipes says they've got to stay. Back at the phones, Mike Smith tells us that things are getting chaotic, with reports of clocks stopping, radios going dead, and microwaves that won't stop making noise. Many more callers reported that their pets were acting strangely for the duration of the programme. One caller even claimed that their son was causing glasses to shatter. Back at the house, Sarah can hardly hear anything through her radio mic and the video feed appears to warp and stutter. Susanna is cowering in a corner behind a chair as Pam sits in front of her. We hear feedback from Sarah's earpiece followed by more banging noises before a framed picture hurls itself from the wall. Sarah goes to find Kim and the camera and mic stay on Suzanne, who begins speaking in the demonic sounding voice. What big eyes you have, she says, reciting lines from Little Red Riding Hood. Pam, now clearly terrified, asks Suzanne if she can hear her and she eventually responds in her own voice, telling her to get out, that she's messed everything up and that she hates her. Upstairs, a frantic Sarah can't find Kim. Downstairs, we briefly see Suzanne leaving the room. As Sarah enters the kitchen, the lights flicker and die, and the TV link to the mini-studio is now showing static. We then see Kim's stuffed bunny rabbit, the one that she's been holding on to for most of the night, lying in the sink drenched in water. Sarah goes to close the fridge door, which is lying open, and finds Kim crouched at its side. When she gets up, she says that he was a bad bunny and reveals that she's pulled out the toy's eyes. We hear the sound of a cat and the crew crowd round the basement door as the mirror on the wall begins to shake. More lights flicker and the video feed is distorted as the crew remove the boards that are blocking the door. It swings open and we can briefly see someone on the inside before the camera moves away again. Sarah panics as it's revealed that a crew member has been knocked out by the falling mirror and is now lying face down, covered with blood and broken glass. 
Suzanne screams from upstairs, saying, he's hurting me and get off me, then cries for her mother before the feed is lost. We're left with the message, normal transmission will be resumed as soon as possible. We go unexpectedly to Craig Charles and Alan Demescu, who are standing outside with no idea what's happening. They seem to think it's been an uneventful night so far. The feed resumes from the house and we see the girls sitting calmly with the crew, pouring a drink of cola. Something doesn't seem right. The hosts take another call from someone who does not want to be named, but has some important information regarding the history of the house. He tells us that Mr and Mrs Severs, who were tenants in the 1960s, sublet one of the rooms to their nephew, Raymond Tunstall. He claims he was Tunstall's social worker after he came out of a psychiatric hospital and that Tunstall had a criminal record for molestation, abduction and related charges. During his time at Foxhill Drive, Tunstall had developed paranoid fantasies, claiming that there was a woman inside his body who was taking over his thoughts and actions, making him do things he didn't want to do. This would eventually lead to Tunstall taking his own life in the space under the stairs. It was 12 days before his body was found, after his cats were heard locked in the house screaming. They were hungry and, with no one left to feed them, the cats had already got to work on Tunstall's face. After the collar hangs up, Dr Pasco starts to wonder how many more terrible things have happened on that site, and Michael Parkinson, somewhat ironically, says they will be taking no more calls and that their switchboards have been jammed. Dr Pasco, however, insists that they keep the lines open. She then notices that, in the supposedly live feed, the picture is still on the wall. It's in the machine, she says, as she tells us the poltergeist is tricking them with the footage that was shot earlier. We then see a collection of distorted video clips and noises before a wind begins to blow within the studio. We've created a seance, says Dr Pasco. A massive seance. Outside the house, we see the injured cameraman being taken away by paramedics as the police start to arrive. Kim and Pam are spotted in the garden before they're led into a police car. Suzanne and Sarah are still missing. We then cut to the camera in infrared mode, which is being operated by Chris. He and Sarah are trapped in the dark and trying to find their way around using a lighter and a torch. We hear banging noises, Suzanne crying for her mother, and back at the studio, chaos is being unleashed as light bulbs smash and random objects begin flying across the set. Sarah and Chris hear Suzanne's voice coming from under the stairs, where she screams, get off me, before the door suddenly flies open. Cats cry out against the blowing wind as Sarah crawls inside, the cameraman grasping at her arm before the door slams itself shut. We can just about see the warped image of a bloody eyeless face on the screen. As the camera jumps to the studio, more lights explode and the crew begin fleeing the set. Parkinson remains as the power cuts and the studio is plunged into darkness. He talks out loud as the lights return and he can't tell which cameras, if any, are still working. We can still see him, but because of the angle, we can no longer see his face. He walks aimlessly around the deserted studio, asking, is anyone still with us, before noticing that the auto cue is still working. Michael Parkinson then recites, round and round the garden, we hear more cats, and the voice of the ghost begins taking over. Didn't believe the story of Mother Seddon's, did you? He says, fee, fi, fo, fum. And this is where Ghostwatch ends its investigations. Did Sarah Green and Suzanne Early manage to escape the house? Has Michael Parkinson been possessed by an evil entity? Is Mr Pipes still at large, rampaging through the nation by the power of telecommunications? At the time, there was no way of knowing.
Now that we've looked at the film in detail, I'd like to talk about the aspects of Ghostwatch that made it so effective, both at the time and even when watching the film today, which I highly recommend. You can watch the full version of Ghostwatch on the Internet Archive via the link provided below. It often becomes available to stream through Amazon Prime or Shudder, so look out for that, plus the film is also available on DVD. A special Blu-ray edition of Ghostwatch, packed with bonus features, is being released for its 30-year anniversary, and I think I'll definitely be making that purchase very soon. So now that we know what happens, here's what I think made Ghostwatch so effective. Ghostwatch was unique in the way that it blended fiction with elements of truth. And this goes beyond its presentation as a live show and having many of the characters playing themselves. The detailed descriptions of the incidents at Fox Hill Drive, along with the meticulous way in which we look at the investigations, procedures and ghost hunting equipment, all help to make the experience feel very authentic. For anyone who's ever had an interest in the supernatural, poltergeist activity or spiritual possession, the way these are described in Ghostwatch should feel very accurate indeed. Even years later, their approach, methods and even the tone of Ghostwatch would be echoed in the likes of Most Haunted, a paranormal investigation reality show that ran for 25 series, or in the found footage genre with Paranormal Activity and The Blair Witch Project. Even if you went into Ghostwatch knowing it was fictional and not believing in ghosts at all, it's hard to deny how immersive it feels and how effectively this ramps up the scare factor. Likewise, it's interesting to analyse how Ghostwatch played with our minds, especially when we think of the technology available when it was first broadcast. On the first rewatch of the research video, especially after several viewers had reported seeing a figure at the curtain, there was a very good chance you'd catch a glimpse of Mr Pipes. However, when the same footage is played back in slow motion, there appears to be nothing there, or at least nothing definitive. Two things would happen. On one hand, you'd swear blind that you saw something, you know you did, and you'd be on high alert for the rest of the programme, but on the other hand, you'd think maybe it was a false alarm, and you'd begin to lose trust in your own perception. And that is terrifying. To see something frightening and not be sure that you actually saw it is one hell of a mind trip. Remember, back in 1992, you couldn't pause or rewind live TV, and even if you were taping it, you couldn't do that and watch the programme at the same time. You certainly couldn't go online and ask anyone else if they'd seen it too. All you could do was keep watching, keep looking, and pray that you weren't going mad. The domestic setting of Ghostwatch was another important factor in making the film work, not just while you were watching, but also after you'd unplugged the TV and tried to get to sleep. The house on Fox Hill Drive looks like an ordinary council house in the UK. The people who lived there looked like ordinary people you might see on your own street. The decor and details of their home were, again, very typical for 1992, and there was every chance that the house you were watching from didn't look all that different. Likewise, the noises created by a central heating system, which at that time of year was probably clanging back into life for the first time since spring, might sound not unlike the noise created by Mr Pipes. All of this adds to the feeling that this could happen anywhere, to anyone, maybe even you or your loved ones. And by placing this idea in the back of your mind, the home you would normally feel safe in, even after going out to see a horror flick, would feel anything but. Every shadow, every creak, every unexplained noise or cat meowing outside would immediately set you on edge. And there would be nowhere else for you to go. Television horror has a unique power in that sense, staying with you all night and making the mundane and familiar into something sinister and unsafe. The pacing of Ghostwatch is, I feel, an underrated aspect of horror that balances perfectly throughout its 90-minute runtime. Its creators were very careful not to hit the audience with too much at once, 
get them invested in the story and its characters, and create a comforting sense of safety and familiarity, only to shatter it later on. While we have the research tapes and the accounts of the early family to establish the paranormal, not a lot happens in Ghostwatch during the first act. Even at that, it feels as if nothing truly terrible can happen within the controlled confines of the investigation, if anything is going to be found there at all. While Pipes might make himself known to two young girls alone in their bedroom, it feels unlikely that he'd do the same thing with a camera crew present and his activity being tracked by machines. However, Pipes lulls us all into a false sense of security as he manages to assume control not just of the house, but later of the studio and, judging by what people are saying on the phone calls, possibly the entire nation. The shock in Dr. Pascoe's voice when she realises it's in the machine hits home as that technology we've been relying on to expose Pipes is now being turned against us. Clearly, we had no idea what this spirit was capable of. Likewise, we find Ghostwatch all the more immersive and frightening once we get to know the characters, not just seeing the emotional damage that's been done to them already, but just in seeing them as ordinary, decent people, the kind that you'd want to keep safe. Once we've seen Suzanne and Kim as ordinary kids, laughing and playing with the presenters and the crew, it makes it all the more shocking whenever we see them act in an unnatural way, like Kimmy and her stuffed rabbit, or Susie talking in the demonic voice. And whether we believe in ghosts or not, we empathise with Pam, who's only trying to keep her family safe, both from unseen forces and ridicule from those around them. We also empathise with Sarah Green, and we dread what we're going to find every time she runs to the children's aid. Like Sarah, we want the girls to be safe, and we understand why she keeps putting herself in danger. Still, probably most of us ended up screaming towards the end, telling her not to go in there. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Kids in horror can be scary as hell. I'm not sure why, but I think it's the combination of innocence and evil that makes them extra sinister. And as adults, we're not sure whether we should be protecting them or running for our lives. Even things associated with children can be creepy in horror, like nursery rhymes and fairy tales, especially when they're told in a manner that feels unusual. And let's not forget, there are a lot of disturbing elements in the original versions of many children's stories already. Seeing Suzanne and Kim falling under the influence of a poltergeist is frightening to watch, and the two actresses did a fantastic job, both in making us fear them and fear for them. Kim creeps us out with how comfortable she is talking about an evil spirit that wants to hurt people and do nasty things, while Suzanne finds herself directly under the influence of Pipes and is forced to do his bidding. The part where she is speaking in his voice is probably one of the scariest moments in all of Ghostwatch. And while the characters might not be real, the types of crimes committed by the likes of Mother Seddons and Raymond Tunstall are disturbing in the extreme. To think of anyone, real or imaginary, that would hurt a child instantly triggers the response that we're being faced with true evil, one that preys on the most vulnerable. This aspect was thought to be too much by several viewers who responded on the BBC's Bite Back programme and claimed the fact that they'd used children was shocking and distasteful. Ghostwatch was hardly the first horror film to do that, but perhaps it was a first for some viewers. When things go wrong in our screens, especially when this involves professional broadcasters, we tend to react to the surprise with one of two responses. Laughter or fear. Laughter is common enough, see every blooper reel ever, and we even get a bit of this early on in Ghostwatch, with Craig Charles and his tomfoolery. However, as the investigation spins out of control, and we no longer have that reassurance, things quickly stop being funny, and we start to realise that anything could happen right now and right in front of us. There's also something unnerving about seeing familiar TV broadcasts or video sequences behaving in an abnormal and unpredictable way. After all, it's been the foundation of many a creepypasta. 
And when those reliable TV personalities, with faces and voices that are normally so professional and composed, even they start to lose it, we feel it in our bones that something is terribly wrong. All that was once safe and reliable has been shattered, and only the fear of the unknown remains. Now we can't bear to look on, but at the same time, we also can't bear to look away. And after that phone call about the glass table, we're not even sure that the horror is safely confined to the TV set anymore. Maybe Pipes is all around us. Just as the film Jaws is more frightening because we barely see the shark, Mr Pipes has become all the more terrifying because of how little we see of him. After hearing the descriptions and seeing the children's drawings, it was most likely that the image you had in your head was far more frightening than any image the BBC could have shown us. To be fair, the Pipes makeup is actually pretty horrible to look at when seen clearly, but when your brain fills in the blanks, then it inevitably becomes much worse. Again, the technology of the time comes into play here, and this is a little harder to replicate while watching Ghost Watch today. Not only would you be unable to rewind or freeze frame on pipes, the quality of your average TV in 1992 would have made the images darker and even more difficult to see, and you'd be left thinking that anything might be lurking in the flickering shadows of your little 90s telly. And of course, as his presence was often heard or felt rather than seen, what you saw hardly even seemed to matter. He'd be right there in every sound, every cold spot and every uneasy feeling you encountered at home that night, and the idea of pipes when your imagination was already running riot would be far worse than anything conjured up on screen. And with that in mind, our last segment will take a look at the ghost, or ghosts, that have been haunting the residents at Foxhill Drive. How much do we know about them from the film, and what are the implications of what's really happening there? This is all in-universe, as Mr Pipes and Mother Seddons are, thankfully, fictional characters, but they still leave us room for speculation, because of course, the rules of horror are made to be broken. Pipes, or Mr Pipes, is a nickname given to the primary antagonist of Ghostwatch. The name comes from Pam Early telling her daughters that the scary banging noise heard around the house is just Pipes. While Pam didn't quite believe this explanation herself, she said this in order to calm down her terrified daughters. However, Kim Early, her youngest child, took this to mean that Pipes is the name of the entity that is haunting the Early family's home at Foxhill Drive. Kim claims to have seen Pipes through a crack in the door under the stairs. She describes him as bald, covered in scratches and with blood over his eye, and he wears a long black dress buttoned up to the neck. She claims that he lives under the stairs, but that he also hides in their bedroom by the window, and that he likes everything freezing cold. She also claims to be able to talk to Pipes, and does so without speaking out loud, and on the night of the Ghost Watch investigation, keeps insisting that Pipes wants them all to stay. While Suzanne, the eldest daughter, doesn't talk about Mr Pipes as openly, she is still very aware of his presence, and finds herself the target of his supernatural abilities. While he is present, Suzanne will often scream at him to get away from her, or get off her, and is sometimes left covered in scratches across her face and the back of her neck. Suzanne also acts as a conduit through which Pipes can speak, often to recite nursery rhymes or fairy tales. The voice, it is noted by professional analysts at Cambridge, is not her own. Pam has also encountered Mr Pipes, most notably in the space under the stairs where she once became trapped and could feel his presence and smell his breath next to her face. Both Kim and Suzanne have produced drawings of Mr Pipes, although Suzanne denies ever doing so. Will Kim gladly shows her drawing on television, which matches her own descriptions and those from viewers calling into the studio, Suzanne's impression is far more disturbing. This version, found by her mother in her exercise book, contains barely legible writing and a drawing that is far more explicit than Kim's, both in its detailed gore and nudity. 
This is clearly distressing to Suzanne, and she insists that it wasn't her who did the drawing. This is also what she says when she is caught making banging noises for the benefit of the TV crew. When coupled with the fact that Pipes has been speaking through Suzanne, it seems likely that he is able to take possession of her in other ways, forcing her to say and do things she may or not be fully aware of. Aside from these incidents, Pipes is known to affect household objects, either by making them move or by using intense temperature changes that cause them to shatter. He is also capable of producing foul odours, causing stains on clothing and creating water from nowhere. Sometimes his presence is announced by the sounds of scratching on the walls or the screaming of cats. However, the most common way he signals his appearance is through loud banging noises, which are often heard through the early home. Apart from this, Pipes has been known to visibly manifest, first to Suzanne, who at the time mistook him for her mother. He does this at several points throughout the Ghostwatch investigation on Halloween night. On this occasion, a night where Pipes possibly becomes more powerful, he is also able to manipulate technology in order to assume control of the residents and the investigation. At the very end of the broadcast, he even seems to be controlling TV host Michael Parkinson and, according to the phone calls, has unleashed untold horrors throughout the UK. Pipes has also managed to resist an exorcism from local spiritualist Arthur Lacey, who claimed to have experienced an overwhelming sense of evil, as well as smelling blood in his hands and falling physically sick for a week. Most of what we know of Pipes and his backstory comes from an anonymous caller to the studio claiming to be the former social worker of a man named Raymond Tunstall. In the 1960s, Tunstall had been an unofficial resident of the house in Foxhill Drive, living in a room illegally sublet by his aunt and uncle, Mr and Mrs Severs. He had a criminal record for molestation, abduction and related charges and has spent time in a psychiatric hospital. During his stay at Foxhill Drive, Tunstall developed paranoid fantasies, claiming there was a woman inside his body who was taking over his thoughts and actions. He began wearing a dress and, as a last resort to escape her influence, took his own life by hanging in the space under the stairs where he kept his tools. Tunstall was alone in the house at the time, save for around a dozen cats, as his aunt and uncle were away on holiday. It took 12 whole days for his body to be found, once the cats had been heard screaming from inside the house, and, with no one left to feed them, Tunstall's face had been left partially devoured. This explains a lot of what we know about Mr Pipes, who is presumably the ghost of Raymond Tunstall. His mutilated appearance reflects what happened to his body after death, with his scratches and missing or bloodied eyes. The sound of the cats also echoes the horrors that took place within Foxhill Drive. The scratches that appear in Suzanne could be an effort from Tunstall to make his story known, as it appears to have been either lost to time or deliberately buried probably due to his criminal background and illegal living situation. It might be his way of ensuring that he and his story are not forgotten, as no one believed him while he was alive. Alternatively, he may be forcing Suzanne to relive or share his suffering, as Tunstall is unable to rest in peace, or the wounds may have been inflicted in anger, as Suzanne is often heard shouting at him to leave her alone. Knowing what we know about Tunstall's history of abducting and molesting children, this takes on a deeply sinister implication, as does Pipes' habit of reciting nursery rhymes. It's also possible that, either in death or in life, depending on the timeline, Tunstall was the one who abducted Judy Welland, a child that went missing in the local area. As a ghost, it's also possible that he attacked the five-year-old that was found knifed or the black dog that was found dead, or perhaps Pipes had influenced or possessed someone else to make them do these things. What is unknown about Raymond Tunstall is at what point his criminal behaviour began and whether or not there was another influence at work. It appears that, at least towards the end of his life, he too became possessed, this time by the ghost of a Victorian woman named Mother Seddons. This explains Tunstall's own account, 
written off as a paranoid delusion, and the long black button-down dress, which would have been a style commonly worn in Mother Seddon's time. We know very little about Mother Seddon's, but what we do know is shocking and disturbing. Known as a baby farmer during life, Mother Seddon's would offer to foster orphan children, most likely for money. However, instead of caring for her charges, she would then kill the children by drowning. Though the area has changed throughout the years, it's believed that she too lived in the exact spot of the haunted house in Foxhill Drive. It may be that Raymond Tunstall was already a criminal who targeted children, and that the ghost of Mother Seddon's found a connection with him as a result. However, it's also possible that he started being possessed by her earlier in life, which could have happened at any point while his aunt and uncle lived in the property and he was visiting. If so, then perhaps at least some of his criminal acts were committed under her influence. It's also uncertain whether Mother Seddon's was even the original source of the evil that haunts Foxhills, or if she was only one in the string of such incidents, most of which have been undocumented or forgotten. Was she even acting of her own accord when she murdered those children? There's no telling how far back these incidents go, whether there's even one source of this dark energy. If Fox Hills itself is built on cursed ground, growing more and more cursed with every violent act, or if this location might be home to a portal or focus point where malevolent spirits, demons and other ungodly horrors revel in their wickedness and attempt to break through to the land of the living. If this is the case, then what became of us all after the night of Halloween in 1992? Did the broadcast unleash the vengeful spirits of Raymond Tunstall and Mother Seddon's along with others? Did this activity awaken spirits or open portals and hellmouths throughout the country? Did we even see the full extent of the chaos or have these forces been biding their time, waiting for the right moment to rise up and unleash hell? Waiting, say, for about 30 years? Ghostwatch is still fascinating as a full-blown horror phenomenon, something that's increasingly difficult to pull off today. Even when it aired, the creators of Ghostwatch were absolutely not prepared for what was to come, and neither were the British public or the BBC. Not since the first radio broadcast of War of the Worlds has there been such a moment in which a work of fiction intrigued and terrified its audience, and it wasn't until the rise of found footage that horror would capture people's imaginations in quite this way since. To find out more about the fallout and media storm that happened in the wake of Ghostwatch, I'd highly recommend the YouTuber Inside a Mind's excellent video on the subject, or the writer Steve Volk's TED Talk, both of which are linked below. And if you'd like to see a more recent example of a piece of horror television directly inspired by Ghostwatch, then you should definitely check out the Inside Number 9 episode Deadline, and check out my video all about how it was made. If you like, no pressure. Does Ghostwatch still hold up today? In my opinion, it absolutely does. So this Halloween, why not settle in for the night, picture yourself back in the UK in the early 90s and see what all the fuss was about. And if you hear any strange noises in the background afterwards, don't worry, it's only pipes. Happy Halloween everyone, and happy 30th birthday to Ghostwatch, my latest rabbit hole of intrigue. I've been meaning to watch this since my deadline review, and I'm very glad I finally got round to it. Also, this is the first video I've made since moving back to Scotland, and let me tell you, moving house is its own horror story, hence I've been so quiet on here and on social media for the past months. But Halloween has inspired me, as it always tends to do. So, have you seen Ghostwatch? What did you think? And if you're one of those people that just has to post a comment telling me I saw it and I wasn't scared, please accept my stock response of very good, have a cookie. Because some of us quite enjoy being scared, thank you very much. And as always, if you have any recommendations for weird or horror related content you'd like me to watch and talk about, 
please leave them in the comments and I'll see you in the next cartoon. Till then, good night.